Hey, fifth grade friends, it's Mrs. Van again. Rudy's right here sleeping. Hey, Rude. Rudy. He says hi to you, his fifth grade friends. He's going to take a nap while we read the story. We're going to read another chapter today in our book, Guest, by Mary Downing Hahn. And I'm going to start recording these just one chapter at a time. It makes it easier on my recording time, and it makes it easier maybe for you guys to see. So we're going to continue on. I hope you guys are doing really well. Um, I still miss you a lot, and we're hanging in there. Both Rudy and I need a haircut. What can you do? Let's get started on Chapter 5 of Guest. Up close, the man was neither handsome nor ugly, neither old nor young. But somewhere in between, he wore a faded black hat with a wide brim. The sleeves of his green jacket were frayed, the fabric faded. The knees of his pants were patched, and his boots were well-worn. A shapeless pack lay beside him. I came near, but not too near. He had the sly eyes of a clever fox, I thought, and I wasn't sure I could trust him after all. Guest pushed, him, pushed himself up to see over my shoulder. He burst into a series of loud clicks and clacks. He can't talk, I said, but the stranger paid me no, step, no mind. Instead, he imitated Guest, as if he were mocking him. Guest's eyes glowed as if someone had lit a lamp in his brain. He waved his thin arms and bounced up and down in his sling until I feared he'd knock me over. Crowing and chirping, the two of them chittered and chattered until the trees around us echoed the din. My head ached with the sound, and finally the man raised his hand and turned his palm toward Guest. Immediately, Guest fell silent, but his gaze was fixed on the man. Were you talking to him, I asked? I was just fooling with him the way you might meow at a cat. The man shifted his sly eyes back to Guest. He's an odd babby if I ever saw one, and no kin to you, I'm sure. What do you call him? Guest is his name. Guest? A strange name for a strange babby. It's what he is, a guest in our house. And where are you taking him so far from any house? I hope to find his people. Travelers they are. He's outstayed his welcome at our house. This stranger asked too many questions, and I was giving him answers as fast as he asked for them. He had a way of drawing words from my mouth like a conjurer doing tricks with scarves and coins. I see, I see, the man rocked back and forth on his heels as if he was thinking this over. The travelers left him with you. Is that the way of it? Hitching guest higher on my back, I said, yes, that's indeed the way of it. And though it's been a pleasure to know you this little bit, we must be going on now. You're seeking the... He paused a moment and grinned once more like a clever fox. The travelers, I believe you said? Aye, the travelers. I moved to the side to step around the man, but he stepped the same way and blocked me. Feeling frightened now, I said, please, sir, let us go by. Without moving, he said, perhaps I can help a wee lass, deep in Mirkwood, far from home, and toting a big baby that weighs as much as she does. I've done well enough so far without your help. But do you even have an inkling of where these so-called travelers might be? Somewhere ahead, not far, I'm sure. I stood my ground, but shivered with cold. The heavy air of night had begun to sink into the forest like a dark fog, filling the spaces between the trees and making it hard to see. I was so tired of walking, so tired of carrying guests and hungry. My belly craved to be filled with cheese and bread. It seems you're too weary to take another step, the man said. Sit here by the rock and I'll make a fire to drive off the evening chill. There's a pair of skinned hares in my sack, ready to cook for supper. Will you join me? My head told me not to say yes to the stranger's offer. But my belly shouted, yes, sit down, let him build a fire, let him cook the hares, eat, Get warm, rest. And so I slid the sling off my weary shoulders. 
Guest crouched beside his new friend and peered into his face as if to memorize every feature. I sank down on the ground and leaned against the mossy rock, which was not as soft as it looked, and also a bit cold and damp. But it felt good to watch the stranger lay a fire. When the flames leaped up, sending a fountain of sparks into the dark leaves overhead, the man turned to me. You've never told me your name, he said, nor have you told me yours. He smiled and spitted the hairs, and as they began to cook, the smell of roasting meat made my stomach rumble. Will you or won't you tell me your name? He asked. Only if you tell me yours. I knew better than to tell a stranger my name, unless he told me his. Knowing a name gives you power over its owner. The man leaped to his feet and bowed. I'm called my dog Ash Esquire, a wanderer by choice with no place to call my own, as at home in a forest as in a village, perhaps more so. I didn't get up, and even if I had, I wouldn't have returned his bow with a curtsy. I'm Molly Cleverall from the village of Lower Hexham, just over the way from Upper Hexham. And your people, who are they? My father is Sam Cleverall, a farmer, and my mother is Agnes. And why have they sent a, such a wee lass such as you to return the traveler's bevy? I shrugged. Someone had to take him. And what do you aim to get from the travelers in return for their bevy? Mad Dog asked. My, I mean nothing. Nothing at all. I just want guests to be gone forever from our home. Why is it I feel you're hiding something from me? I picked up a stick and poked at the fire. Guest squatted beside me and began pinching my arms. I swatted his hands away, and he nipped my cheek with his little teeth. Medog made a sharp noise and clapped his hands. Immediately, Guest reached out to him and began his babble of strange sounds. Come now, Molly, this is no traveler's babby, Medog said. Why lie about it? He's a changeling left with your family by the kind folk. Did you think I wouldn't know his true nature? I took the roasted leg of hair Madog offered and began to gnaw the meat from it, tough and stringy as it was. I said what I said, for some people have a strong dislike of changelings. You don't seem to like him much yourself. I despise him. He's hateful and nasty, and he drove Dad out from our house and wore my mother down to almost nothing. But you see, it's my fault the kind folk took my brother. I plan to set things right again. And how do you plan to do that? If you must know, I mean to swap the changeling for my brother. Madog shook his head. I'm a man who knows much more about the kind folk than you do. He leaned across the fire to see me better. His eyes reflected the flames. I turned my head to the side so as not to look into their green depths. A person could drown in eyes like Madog's. Madog stirred the fire so the flames leaped up again and lit his face from below. The kind folk will most certainly not trade your brother for the changeling. You had best turn around tomorrow and go home. I cannot go home without Thomas. I reached into my dress and showed him the locket on its silver chain. I'll trade this as well as guests for him. Madog startled me by jumping back from the locket. Put that away, he said. The kind folk won't give you anything for that. They cannot bear the touch of iron, nor can I or guest keep it tucked away so as not to harm us. But it's not iron, it's silver. It's silver on the outside, but iron underneath. Show it to guest. Don't touch him with it. Just hold it in front of him. The moment guest saw the locket, he covered his face with his hands and began to howl as if I'd heard him. I slipped the locket back inside my dress and looked at Madog. Iron is poison to kind folk, and anyone who shares their blood. That includes travelers and changelings. Keep it close to you always. It will protect you from them and their creatures. Sophie wants to be part of this, too. Once the locket was out of sight, Guess began pinching and biting me again. His teeth had grown sharp, and it was all I could do not to slap him. Thrusting the jug of milk into his mouth, I muttered, Go on, little pig. But mind you, there'll be no more when it's gone. Guest has teeth, Madog said. 
Madog said. He should be weaned. Pulling a piece of tender meat from the rabbit's carcass, he held it in front of guests. Guest, try this. The changeling looked at the tasty morsel dangling in front of his nose. Casting aside the jug, he grabbed the meat and sniffed. Into his mouth it went. You see, Madog asked me. Guest won't starve. He'll eat what you eat right enough. I watched Guest chew the meat and swallow it down. All that remained in my bag was a bit of cheese and a stale crust of bread. Not enough for me, let alone to share with him. Madog winked at Guest and began to speak again in sharp bits and bites of harsh sounds. Guest cocked his head as if he understood. And turning his yellow eyes to me, he said, Molly. He touched Madog's face. Madog. Pointing to himself, he said, Guest. His voice was high and raspy, and he spoke fast, but I understood him. He speaks better in his own language, Madog said, but he'll learn yours fast enough. He already understands more than you realize. Turning back to Guest, Madog lifted him to his feet. Show Molly what else you can do. For a moment, the changeling stood there, wobbling a bit, getting his balance like an overgrown toddler. Finally, drawing a deep breath, he took one step, and then another. After he t tottered all the way around the fire, he collapsed next to Madog in a heap of scrawny legs and arms and gave me a sly grin. You little beast. I was so angry I almost slapped him. To think I carried you all this way. Madog laughed. For sure, the rascal has more tricks than I do, and that's saying something. It's not funny. My back hurts from carrying him, He's heavy, and he wriggles and squirms and kicks and pinches. He made me stumble and almost fall over and over again. Now, Molly, don't be angry with him. How could he keep up with you? Surely a fox would catch him and gobble him up. I looked at Guest, annoyed that he'd tricked me. He's big enough now to keep up with me, and what fox would eat a bundle of skin and bones like him? Enough of this complaining, Maddox said. You've both come a long way today. And this little scamp must be tired out. He raised his hand, palm facing Guest. Lie down and sleep. And without a word, Guest lay down on his blanket, his eyes closed. He breathed deeply and evenly, and he slept. I wish Mam had known that trick. She might have gotten more sleep. True enough, Madog leaned back on one elbow and stared at me across the fire. From what he tells me, I understand Guest has not heard one kind word from you or your ma'am. She fed him, and you watched over him, but neither of you had any thought except getting Thomas back. You, Molly, would have killed him if you'd dared. Don't deny it. I wanted our Thomas, I said in a low, shamed voice. Not guessed. Wouldn't anyone? At least we didn't leave him at the crossroads, as some do. True enough, but a wee bit of kindness. Was that too much to give him? You weren't there. You didn't hear him scream and cry without end. He was at ma'am all day and all night, sucking like a greedy pig. No matter how much milk she gave him, it was never enough. He was killing her. Madog sighed. <sighs> the poor pitiful creature wasn't made for human milk. Hungry he was, but the more he ate, the more his belly ached. Is it any wonder he screamed day and night? Why isn't he screaming now, then? Because he's drinking cow's milk from the jug you brought. That's all you had to do, you know. Give him cow's milk. Too bad you weren't around to tell us. Maddox sighed. I didn't know you had him, did I? Well, I won't have him for long. I'll find the kind folk. Very soon, and they'll take him. They will. And I'll go home with Thomas. He shook his head, and his shadow moved against the rock behind him. The ones you seek are far from here and hard to find. They don't look kindly on mortals who cross the border into their land. Isn't Mirkwood their land? Isn't it where they live? Mortals and kind folk alike come and go in Mirkwood. The kind folk's land lies on the other side. If you know so much, why can't you take Guest and me to them? The kind folk bear a grudge against me. It would do more harm than good for me to lead you there. But I can tell you how to find them. The firelight played with his face, lighting his nose, then his eye, then his chin, making him waver as if he were a shadow himself or a ripple on the water. Who are you anyway? Who are you people? Where do you come from? Let's say I'm a man you don't meet every day. And glad I am of that. 
Meeting you, one of you every day would indeed be misery. Ha, you're not the first to say that, and I'm sure you won't be the last, said Madog, and stirring the fire, he created a fountain of sparks between us. Do you have dealings with the kind folk? I asked in a low voice. Perhaps, Madog drew his tin whistle from his pocket and began to play a mournful tune. Too tired to ask any more questions, I stopped struggling to keep my eyes open. And with a sigh, I lay down in the moss and ferns and fell at once into a deep sleep. If I had dreams, I did not remember them. And that's chapter five of our book guest. So look forward to chapter six. I'm really getting into this book. I'm hoping you guys are liking it as much as I am. I apologize. You probably heard my cat Sophie, Rudy's sister, meowing a lot. And you might have seen her head peek up here. But I really hope you guys are doing well, and I really, really miss you, my fifth graders. Um, so we'll have another chapter of guest going up in the next day, and I look forward to reading more to you then. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.